Welcome everybody. If you haven't answered the trivia questions, please do so right now because we're getting ready to go over the answers. I'll give you another minute or a few seconds or so. All right, here we go. First question. This self-made millionaire and philanthropist created hair products, sold house to house, and later held what we what may have been known as the first nat national meeting of business women in the US in 1917. Most of you said Madam C.J. Walker, and that's correct. Madam C.J. Walker invented a line of African-American hair, hair care products after suffering a scalp ailment that resulted in her own hair loss. She promoted products by traveling around the country, giving lecture demonstrations, and eventually established the Madam C.J. Walker Laboratories to manufacture cosmetics and train sales beauticians. Second question. This entertainer was one of the most famous jazz singers from the Harlem Renaissance, known as Lady Day. Most of you said Billie Holiday. And that's correct. Nicknamed Lady Day by her music partner, Lester Young, Billie Holiday was an African-American jazz and swing music singer with a career that spanned over 26 years. Third question. This woman was the first of color to enter space on the shuttle Endeavor in 1992. Who is she? Most of you said Dr. Mae Jemison. And that is correct. Dr. Jemison was not only an astronaut, but also a physician who became the first African-American woman to enter space. So thank you all for participating. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Keith. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for participating in our last uh, Black History Month event. We are so appreciative and thankful to all of you, our colleagues, for sharing in this experience with us and for allowing us um, to bring you um, a glimpse of the Black experience in the United States. And as you may have uh, been keenly aware, we, fo we focused the program this year on agriculture because that's the heart of who we are as an organization. So we thought it would be appropriate to bring to you the experiences of African Americans and Black folks in agriculture. So thank you for allowing us to take you on this journey and share again a glimpse of the experience, the Black experience um, as we see it in the United States from an ag perspective. So, so thank you very much. A couple of things too that I wanted to bring to your attention. There are a few trends in agriculture these days that most of you may or may not be aware of. And so we just wanted to bring those trends forward just so that you could think about them in the context of the conversation that we're going to have with our distinguished panelists this afternoon. So we have to think about agriculture in a lot of different ways, but the trends that that are that are sort of uh, percolating in ag and probably have been around for some time, but certainly things that need to be aware that we need to be aware of uh, include the evolving food and agriculture system. A lot of how we consume food is changing. And so as farmers and as agriculturalists, we have to be aware of that. Trade expansion is critical. Uh, opening new markets, uh, developing new customers is a, an important part of agriculture. Uh, policy, farm sector policy, how are um, um, ag, especially big ag, but in a lot of cases, urban farmers, um, how, are, how is policy shaping their ability to grow their businesses and build sustainable uh, farming systems? Enhancing the infrastructure. I'm sure we'll hear something about that today from our panelists. Conservation and the environment. Uh, what is our footprint ag on the environment? Rural communities, how are they um, um, evolving um, in the changing urban landscape as, as our country becomes less agrarian um, and has been over several decades, but certainly accelerating in the last few. And nutrition and food assistance. Uh, what role do agriculturalists and farmers play in that system? So we wanted to bring that forward to you just as a uh, something to think about and consider. So with that, I'll turn it over to my distinguished colleague, Dr. Esther Mosase. Mosase, I, I knew I was gonna get it wrong. Mosase, go ahead, Esther. 
Well, um, it's the first time I hear someone pronounce it pro uh, correctly, Mosase. Just spell it as it's written. But yes, I am Esther Mosase. I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. And in this session, as Keith has mentioned, we'll be looking at, we want to get into the journey with our farmers in California. And we want to hear what they have to share with us. The discussion is open. Well, mostly the achievement that I'll look for agriculture in the future, probably also touching on their struggles as they're going, doing the farming. So I will uh, be open right now. I'm just telling you that you, uh, you can put in the question as the, your questions in the chat as the discussion is going on and we will, uh, we will allow them to answer them at the end of, of the session. I think we have like 20 minutes, 15 minutes for the questions. And I want to say it is my honor to introduce you to our panelists. We have Dennis, we have Donald, and we have William. And by this way, I just, I'm open to them to like, okay, they should, they should go ahead and introduce themselves where are they located? Who are they? Where are they located? And what are they farming? Like, can I go and ask for pumpkins or am I looking at a dairy farm? So, so, so we can start the stage. Um, I will be handing out to you, Dennis, to start over by introducing yourself. Dennis, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, I am Dennis Hudson. I'm originally from Denison, Texas. Uh, been, I'm a United Methodist minister. I, I live in Allensworth, California. Um, I retired, but now I'm pastoring again in Lemoore and Armona in the Central Valley. Uh, Allensworth is historically a black town. It is not all black anymore. It's mostly Hispanic. But uh, Colonel Allensworth, who founded that town, uh, founded it to, as a, a, a farming community which could help black people be self-determined and to contribute to society and all and be self-governed. And so what I am doing is I have a 60 acre farm and um, I really want, I'm, I'm growing oats right now. I did have alfalfa in the past and wheat in the past, um, but I have a garden where I have been growing okra, black eyed peas, watermelons, cantaloupes, uh, and then this this African um, uh, product called Awedu, uh, which is called Egyptian spinach. And so the Filipinos, the you know, Middle Easterners, they eat it. So that's what I do. Thank you. And I will go to Donald. If you can introduce yourself shortly to the to our our attendees. Thank you. Uh, Donald Sherman, uh, born and raised right here in the Central Valley. You know, the parents migrated from Louisiana in their early 50s uh, here to California. And, uh, you know, the family's been farming in the farming business, uh, uh, working in the industry since, uh, since the early 60s. Uh, right now, I am the only one in my family, along with my son who, who assists me. Uh, that uh, that's a uh, uh, farmer at the time. Um, it's not the only thing that I've done. I've, I'm, you know, I worked for the state of California for about 22 years, just retired from them in uh, 2018. And now I'm uh, uh, pretty much doing, doing the full-time farming thing now, so. Thank you, Donald. William? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, appreciate y'all just again for sharing. Sorry, Lisa, I'm on a call real quick. Um, just appreciate the sharing and to hear where y'all are coming from. Right now, I'm in Albany, California um, at the Gilchak Farm, which some of y'all may have heard of. It's been a farm that's been occupied, but unfortunately, it's owned by the university. So there's a very limit to like what we can do, what we can grow. But right now, you know, one of the 
the few black people in Albany um, trying to make sure that there are more black indigenous melanated people coming to the land here. Um, I have a privilege to be on the farm right now. So I can kind of show y'all a little bit what we're growing. We've got the cover crop, fava beans, snow peas, veg. And then because we're in California, we, we have the blessing of being able to grow year round. So most of our greens are on the other side of the field like collard greens, chard, kale. Um, so it is a community farm. I don't really get paid to be at this particular farm. So I have to have different lines of work and income. Um, but yeah, I'm the only person in my family growing farming. I'm a transplant to California. I was born in Mobile, Alabama, grew up in Texas. And right now I'm just trying to figure out a way to be here and honor the indigenous people of the land since we are in the village of Huchin, of the Lishan Ohlone people. And at the same time, yeah, go back to my roots and growing food, being with the land and having security in that way. So I'm grateful for this topic of conversation. Thank you for all for sharing. And I think another question, I know you have touched on it a little bit to be like, how long have you farmed? I know some people have answered it, but some people have not touched on it. If you haven't, how long or your family have farmed and how, what are the specific actions that have uh, taken, that you have taken to maintain or to keep the land or to let to be so that the land is in your family for this long, if you have had this farm for long. Um, Donald, <laughs> I'll just uh, randomly pick you up. <laughs> I, I have personally uh, been farming for about uh, uh, about 30 years on my own. Uh, and, and like I said uh, before, the family started uh, farming in the early 60s. But one of the, one of the challenges has always been um, you know, not being able to sustain because of prices and not being able to get proper prices for what you grow. So um, just in the um, last part of the 80s, we decided to make the shift and said, hey, you know, we're going to start selling directly to the public to be able to sustain. So and uh, that's the reason why I, I have, you know, bought property in the city and, and, and maintain and still running my own fruit stand inside of the city at this time. Wonderful. Dennis, you want to weigh in on the question? Dennis, you're muted. All right, I'm on mute now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, have been, I have been farming for uh, since 2007. Uh, we bought the farm December 2007, and I've been farming since then. Um, at the same time, though, I was had just retired from the military and was pastoring a, a church in Las Vegas. Um, now, one of the things is that I, that I found very quickly is I could not get a mortgage for the farm, even though I put more than one third down on this land. And the reason I could not get a mortgage was because um, it did not have water. The person I bought it from had like 11 wells, but they were not on this property. And uh, he, he was trying to start a water district, which he was not able to do. So, so they would not give me a mortgage financing because it did not have water. So I had to immediately uh, have a well drilled. So it costs hundred thousand dollars put in a, a seven hundred twenty foot deep well, okay. And so right off, that's one of the kinds of things that that is an, a hindrance or an obstacle to going into farming. You would think it's easy to do, but it's so capital intensive. It costs so much to be able to operate a farm and sustain it. Uh, uh, so once I did that. Um, I was able to start growing crops. The equipment, I had to buy a lot of used equipment in order to get started, use tractor, use implements, things like that. So, so uh, by working with say Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, I was able to get grant money. I have been working with California Department of Food and Agriculture. I've gotten grants. So with Natural Resource Conservation Service, I was able to buy a tractor. With the grant, I was able to build the farm up uh, to organic status. Uh, we're not, we have not uh, become 
I'm organic certified because I haven't filled out the paperwork yet, but we have met, we will have met all the requirements to do that through Natural Resource Conservation Service, hedgerows, windbreaks, that kind of thing. Uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the Healthy Soils Program, lots of compost and stuff to, to build up the soil uh, and uh, the, the uh, sweep uh, uh, state water energy enhancement program is a grant that enables us to retrofit the pump and well to make it more efficient so that it increases the pressure. So those are the kinds of things that, that, that are, uh, you must be able to avail yourself of in order to maintain a farm and sustain it. Say it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Uh, just to uh, let the um, people know, SIP started in 2014, and AH, AH, HSP, which is Healthy Soils Program, started 1918. So there are new programs, but it's good to know that you guys have been keeping land up to now before you got the funding. I'll go to Will, the same question. Yeah. Um, definitely thank you, Dennis, for saying all that. It was all necessary to say. Um, I have been, been farming more than three years now. I'm 24 years old, and so I got into farming around 21, 22 in college um, when I saw some classes that could be aligned with regenerative agriculture, you know, food policy, um, land rights, land access. So, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really short journey for me. I'm learning a lot, but ultimately like any, everything to what Dennis has said, like the barriers to access, like it is not an occupation you just jump into and have hella support, especially as a black person. Are, already you have barriers enough to, to, to just live life. But on top of that, like going back to the earth, doing things that are sustainable for our communities and our people, like in my opinion and all the things that I've learned, it, it, it is not something that they want us to do you know, anybody, but especially, you know, within Black communities, they don't, they don't want that sort of self-sustainability. Um, and when I say they, I talk about the system at large, you know, the people at top, the people in power. So I'm luckily to, to be aware of that and to be know that everything that I'm doing is trying to create the right network. So once the land opportunity does open up for me that I'm prepared and I'm trained and I have the experience that I need and the people that I need to do it in a way that's sustainable and not kind of replicating some mistakes and patterns that I don't, I don't need to be replicating. Um, so really short, you know, and all, all in all, but um, yeah, I have a long road ahead of me. Thank you, Will. I think this leads us to, uh, to my next question is, I've had a lot of people, particularly young people, like there's no money in farming. I don't want to farm no more. There's a lot of work. I just want you guys to share your the, anything that is rewarding on um, on your work. Like, what is it rewarding? What is the is, is it that is rewarding? Just to farm and bring uh, bring food to the table for other people. Um, anyone who wants to start, I will be open to anybody. D Donald, <laughs> sorry, Donald. <laughs> Well, there's 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 definitely money in it, but but just like a, a, a gentleman was, uh, um, uh, Dennis was was mentioning. I mean, there's there's all kinds of obstacles because, you know, um, you're finding a, a, a lot of farmers have to uh, not only you know get the land, um, produce produce the crop, but you also have to do marketing and. and and get the crop into town. And so now, you know, um, all the challenges, I mean, there, there is money there, but you, you have to have the tools to be able to do it. I mean, even for myself, I'm uh, uh, probably here within the next couple of months, I'm going to purchase a refrigerated truck so I can get my crop from the Central Valley into the Bay Area too. You know, not only just around here in Fresno, but up into the Bay Area too. You know, you have to wear a lot of hats. I got to try and build a business. I got to grow the fruit. I got to deliver the fruit. Uh, you know, so 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 it's a challenge. But there there is money there once you can get yourself established. Thank you, Donald. Dennis, why do you farm? Why are you doing it? How? Why is it? Is it rewarding to you? And if yes, how? It it is it is 
real rewarding being able to get that fresh, high quality things to my people. I mean, you know, you, you, you look and you see that. And, and when I have uh, uh, 80 year old ladies, you know, appreciate the fact that they can get that type of nutrition. Uh, now things that they remembered when they were young and it's, and it's still available to them. And I do everything I can to make sure that that stuff is priced in a way to where people can uh, purchase it. And, and, and that's, a, that's a challenge too, because everything else goes up. So, uh, but, but so far, you know, we've been able to, uh, been able to do that, but that's, that's, that's one of the biggest reasons why I do what I do. Uh, to you, Dennis, why do you do it? Why do you keep doing it? Um, how is it, um, is it, is it um, rewarding to you to do? Let's share with us. Oh, okay, can you hear me now? Oh. We hear you now. <laughs> yes, we hear you. You're muted again, uh, Dennis, Dennis. You are muted again. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. He's fighting with me, but. <laughs> um, Dennis, you are still muted. I think you interchange between. There you um, go, Dennis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, um, what I, I I am fulfilled in doing this. Uh, it says start my video. That was um, me, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Okay. I I am fulfilled in doing this because I I have received uh, a, a vision to help improve this community of Allensworth. This little town was about to die. And um, I, I, I was given this vision. And, and so what I want to do is grow healthy food. And, and, and let me just take us back just for a moment. We came to the United States. We were brought to the United States to grow food. We were growing the food. Now, many of us, our ancestors, when they had a chance to get away from, from doing that kind of stuff, they did. But we were growing the food. Now, food is killing us. You got to have, <laughs> people have to have healthy food. And this is what Donna was talking about, healthy food. And the healthy food, if nobody grows it, then we won't have it. And I remember as a child growing up, everybody had a garden. If they had an apartment, if they had a house, that everybody had a garden. Well, people don't do that anymore. You ask people where to ask kids where do tomatoes come from? They say the store because they don't actually grow up seeing tomatoes uh, uh, growing on 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 a on a vine. So I, I do it because it's a, it's a vision that I was given. I want people to have healthy food, and I believe that people can hear in what I in Allensworth, what I'm trying to do is I want to be able to educate. I want to be able to have demonstrations where people can actually see it. We have a state historic park here. I want to be able to grow food and then we can use it at the park for vending and, and people can actually see where it came from. And so these are the kinds of things I want to do. Yes, it is very uh, fulfilling, uh, but it's hard work and it's a lot of work. Thank you, Dennis. William? William, um, do you hear me? Yeah, sorry, y'all. I'm on, I'm on mute. Um, but yeah, that's a layered question. You know, we, we do these things for a lot of reasons. I personally do it for a lot of reasons. I do it for my family. I do it for my ancestors, the land. Um, but like, you know, it's already been said, I just want to reiterate, you know, we, we grow food. That's what we do, you know, sustainable communities, but also as black people, as indigenous people, this is how we sustained ourselves by growing our food, you know, staying within our communities and also helping each other and like showing up for each other in different ways. So uh, all I've learned about um, oppression, all I've learned about environmental degradation, a lot of that goes back to the land and goes back to particularly food, how people grow their food all the pollution happening, deforestation, you know, undocumented labor, you know, un unfair labor, all of that is happening through the guise of food, how people are using the land, monoculturing, GMOs, like all of that stuff 
um, is represented in how we treat the earth. And so like my thing with the food was like, how do I make the biggest impact possible? Um, you know, with my positionality, with my, my passions and my skills. And to me, that was clearly through the work in the land and being a facilitator and a land steward. And I like to use the word land steward over farmer because that's how I feel. You know, I, farming is occupation, it is a job, but for me, like it's a passion and like something that is very clear that I need to do for my mental, spiritual, physical well being, you know, on top of all of the other, you know, parts that I can do to help community, especially youth, come back to the land and really figure out that the land and the things that that come from the land are the original teachers and the original like classroom in a lot of ways too and i think we we have been institutionalized to think that we have to learn inside of a classroom with wall, walls and chairs and things like that but there is so much replicated already in nature and giving people the opportunity to see that within their food but also within their community and like with people and working together um that's an invaluable lesson to me and i want i want that for the next several generations Thank you for sharing. Um, the theme is healthy foods, fresh foods. And um, it looks like we are going back to our ancestors and plowing, planting the same way they do. And this, uh, this decade that they talk that we should do regenerative farming, farming, uh, looking at the environment so you don't degrade the environment. And um, thank you for sharing. I want to ask this question. Um, we have, I think it was our second session. We had a video, we had some videos where we were showing black farmers farming in different other places in the United States and having some struggles just because there are black farmers farming. So my question is, in what ways might you have your experiences and concerns as black farmers? be distinct from those of white farmers or other races? Like, can you talk to that? Have you have any um, circumstances or experiences where you feel that these are the struggles or this is what I'm doing or getting because of the color of my skin? Um, we just want to put it out there because we have a head and we've seen so many growers elsewhere in the United States struggling because of their color. It's not only the struggle in only in farming, it's a struggle everywhere else. We just want to know if you have experiences such. And I'll start with you, William. <laughs> um, what, do, what do you have to say about the question? Yeah, for sure, An another layered question. Um, I thought about it when, when getting to see the questions before, but I think a big thing which has already been touched upon is just there's a lot of trauma in, in farming and particularly working the land. Like, um, as Dennis said, like our ancestors have been doing this. So my ancestors in Virginia have, have been working the land forcibly for a thousand, for hundreds of years, you know, on, on this continent, on this country. So um, I just think about how, you know, coming back to the land is such a traumatic thing to do. And that sometimes that's not acknowledged. And so that's not always seen. And so when you do feel, um, yeah, discomforts, even in meeting settings. I think a lot of the work that I'm doing um, in farming is with community and those dynamics of like being the only black person present, you know, being the only sometimes, yeah, melanated person present. Like you, you, have to, you have to come against certain things and understandings and explaining yourself and justifying yourself and talking about, you know, microaggressions in, in ways that, you know, not other people have to do. Um, on top of the different barriers that have been mentioned, like access to land, access to to grants and funding, and just being compensated for this for this work, um, but it's so different. It's completely different. It's it's um you know there's so many similarities, of course, but yeah, to be farming in black now, currently, you have you have had to survive a lot. You know, you've had to have um, kept family and land safe in your in in your family for generations. You have had to like go against violence. Like my my great great grandma, um, who was from, who lived in Virginia, like she got pushed off of the only land that I know that's ever been in my family because the KKK burned her house down, and that that sort of violence is not is not um, it's not rare. That's how a lot of people, a lot of black people, have lost their land, and that's that's the starting point for a lot of people in my position. Where we're trying to go back to the land, we're trying to reclaim growing food, 
in, and not this like elitist hobby where we can just do this and have fun because we want to take pictures, but actually doing this for to make a difference and to make a change. And that's like a, a you know responsibility that I hold. And I think that that comes with, yeah, at the end of the day, who I am, my background, how my dad grew up, you know, how my family's been treated, how I've been treated in this work being called have the police called on you because you're in albany or in berkeley where they don't they're not used to seeing black people you know on the land especially in places like this so you know there's a there's a lot there's a lot to go into but i, I can stop there i see dennis and donald in agreement and i think a lot of other people dennis would you weigh in into the question dennis you are muted there we go can you, you can hear me now right <laughs> yes Okay, so you know, I, I I really hate you can't see me because I can't see you all either. I don't know what happened. I was seeing everybody earlier, but anyway, we can back... see you. We can see oh, you. Oh, you can see me, really? Uh -huh. Oh my goodness! Yes. Now that's scary. You can see <laughs> you all, but 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 um, what I would say to that is, and I appreciate what William was saying. Um, I think one of the things is historically, black people were not really permitted to own property. We, we were not. And, 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 and so, uh, and then if we were a, somehow were able to get property, maybe someone willed it to us or whatever, you know, like the slave owner or whatever, uh, slave master, you know, divided up some property and gave it to people. Well, you got it, but then people tried to take it from you, whether it's big businesses or, or, or whether it's uh, 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 any other kind of a, a, a terrorist group or whatever. We ended up losing our property and taxes. You know, if you can't, if you if you're not making enough money and then our, our family move away and nobody's paying the taxes, people are keeping up with who's paying their tax and who's not and then they go in they pay the tax and then then they end up with the property so so those are some of the hindrances but but one of the things that i want to point out is in america we have a capitalistic system and to mention the word socialism just caused people to cringe because they think it's it is it, is something that's that's that that's not right but but what I would say to you is capitalism causes people, it, it, it's inherent, inherent in capitalism is competition. And you compete and you don't necessarily work together, you work against one another. And so when you work, and that's what's, what's happening with, with so many of our, 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 our farmers. When I listened to Donald talking about him, him getting a truck and, and, and being able to, to transport his produce, I, I applaud that. We we really have to have more like co-ops where where one person is can can grow something a few things very well somebody else can grow a few things very well and and, and as you do you come together and 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 then you you are able to to have a a larger variety and everybody then can 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 prosper but when you try to do it by yourself because of the capitalism then that's where we end up with uh, obstacles and hardships that are almost insurmountable. Uh, let me speak to the, the, the competition thing. Uh, I, I remember the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, told me that I, I could, you know, trade in this old tractor through this program and get a brand new tractor. And, and, and so when they called me and, and after I'd done the application, they called me and said that my application has been approved and, and, and I, I would be able to get the tract in, in about a couple of weeks. There was a guy who harvested, who harvested our uh, alfalfa. He just happened to be here when they called. And, 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 uh, and so he said, he heard that and he said, um, yeah, I, I got two of those tractors on that program. Uh, it's going to take you about eight months or so before you get, maybe a year before you get it. Well, I, I was able to get that tracked in, 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 in like two weeks, but I thought to myself, why didn't you tell me about a program like that? Why did you sit on that information? You got two tractors. I even bought this used tractor from you. Why did you not tell me about a program like that, that the government has that is available to a person like me? That's what the competition does. And, and, and it leaves you out there on your own 
trying to make it. And so not, you may not have the information that you need in order to succeed. I'll stop with that. Thank you, Dennis. Donald? Well, you know, um, just to just to kind of uh, go along with some of what, that, what Dennis said, um, you know, and, and that refrigerated truck that I hope to be able to purchase um, is is not only just just for for me, but uh, I'm going to try and assist uh, with with any of the other black farmers in the areas to be able to move their product too and help them because they they have the same same issues. Mm -hmm. But but my my thing is is you know we don't have any black brokers that are looking out for black farmers and looking out for our crops. We don't have any black markets, big markets to be able to guarantee where we sell our stuff. I mean, the whole network needs to be improved. We need to have some of our people doing a whole bunch of those things to be able to, to be able to sustain, you know, um, you know, whether whether school teachers and then just just the whole the whole circle that needs to be where we, we need more of our people in there to look out and understand what what's going on. And, and it is hard trying to do everything yourself, you know, trying to form a market, do, do all these different things. But, uh, you know, for, for other farmers, a lot, of, a lot of that structure is there. They, they, they have the deals, they have the contract, they have guarantees where their stuff is going. We don't, you know, and uh, being able to uh, try and expand uh, out to more land, uh, you know, it's like myself. I think in total, I'm just farming like about seven acres okay, but I, I want 20, I want 30, you know, so, but, but uh, it, it's tough, you know, trying to buy everything and it, and it's taken a long time to get to just where I'm at right now, but I've been, you know, I don't have any quitting me I, and I don't I have no intentions of quitting, but, mm -hmm. but it is an uphill battle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, for sharing. So what I hear is the growers uh, not having other growers to assist them to advance or to sell and probably looking for, probably there are already established organizations, but probably it's difficult to get into such organizations. So you are looking for, let's say, uh, organizations probably which will be acceptable to other people to like, um, donors to Williams to Wills so that they can um, sell their produce and it is easy for them. So they don't start from growing uh, all the way to marketing. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And this brings me to another question. I think some of you touched on it uh, when you were talking about maybe getting funding from different organizations. So my question is, how have the universities, the financial institutions, and UC Corporate Extension or UCNR, because you are in UCNR, how have they helped you in your work? And what would you like to see them do? How, what would you like to see these 143 people in the Zoom meeting today do to assist you in all these efforts that you are trying to do? Uh, Dennis? Yeah. Dennis, you are Got you, got you, got you. Okay. So um, let me just say real quick that um, Ruth Dahlquist, uh, who is the extension agent for uh, Fresno and Tulare County, uh, I met her and, and talked with her and <clears throat> as she has been most helpful in that she, first of all, that's how I met, that's how I met Esther. Uh, we were at a, a workshop that, that Ruth was, was, was hosting in, in, uh, in, in uh, Visalia, Tulare, I believe. And uh, one of the things that she did was she knew what my situation was here. Uh, we had had an earthquake a, a while back. I think you all remember we had a couple of, uh, of small earthquakes. And uh, what that did was it caused that cement flood pipe that I have uh, going across the field. It, it caused it to, to, to crack. And so I had leaks. Um, so, so the sweet 
program, that's uh, uh, State Water Energy Enhancement Program. She told me about that, and, and that's how I was able to get PVC pipe put down to replace the cement pipe. That, that, that provides flooding for the field. Um, and, and that was a grant. Uh, that's how I'm able to get the, the well and, 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 and pump retrofitted through that program. Um, she told me about the uh, uh, Healthy Soils program. And, 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 and so, so I, I get, I've gotten something like $88,000 for a three year period to uh, to put down compost each each year, uh, and to put down a, a hedgerows and, and, and windbreak on on ten acres of, of the property. Uh, through Natural Resource Conservation Service, we were able to put in hedgerows and windbreaks around the uh, uh, fifty acres. Okay, and so this is how I think we are able to utilize these institutions. Now, I would go a little further and say, Allensworth has a, a tremendous arsenic problem with its water. And uh, we had a group of people come out to, to visit one time and, and they wanted to hear all about Allensworth and, and we met with them and talked with them. And so uh, as they were getting ready to leave, one of the persons asked, uh, well, is there anything that we might be able to help you with? And my brother-in-law said, yeah, you know somebody that, that can get arsenic out of our water? And, and there was this guy that was sitting there and he says, I think I do. <laughs> we, we were just shocked. You know, he said, I think I do. I'll get back in touch with you. He was, this was a, a, a professor at UC Davis that, that's pretty much, I think, over the agricultural program. And he knew somebody at UC Berkeley that he had been working with who was, uh, was uh, working on extracting arsenic out of the water. And they came out and did a field test on our farm uh, a few summers ago. And, and they were able to get the arsenic below 150 parts per billion. They got it down to less than two parts per billion. You see, and so, 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 so now we're looking at how we can um, build off of that program. So you got UC Davis and UC Berkeley, who uh, have worked together to help us do this. Okay, get get this arsenic out of the water, and and, and then the last thing I would say is, you have a lot of philanthropists. And um, we know that Tom Steyer ran for office. Uh, he was in the primaries and everything, running for president. And then he, 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 he bowed out. His wife, Kat Taylor, uh, she has a foundation. And that foundation, um, it, it, she's got a couple of things going. One of them is the good life. And, and, and we received a grant from that good life program. Uh, and that will help. Uh, she also has uh, Growing the Table, which is a program that is working with farmers and especially people of color, women, uh, uh, working, with, working with them to uh, purchase their product and then transport it to like food banks or to school cafeterias. So, so we that 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 becomes this get back back to what Donald was saying. This helps with a market, you see, and, and so um, so those are the things that I would say. There are resources we just have to know about them, and one of the ways we know about them is by being in relationship with others, and so that we get a get to benefit from what they know, and they get to benefit from what we know. Okay, I said a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Donald. <laughs> yeah, um, um, Dr. Ruth has been uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, and, and I have to say for me personally, um, uh, because, of the, because of the relationships way back in the early 70s, you know, my brothers, you know, trying to deal with the USDA and, you know, about the suits and all of that stuff. Um, I, I've been one that always shied away from that. You know, and never, never wanted to get grants. Never wanted to have anything to do with any government of any sorts because they, they, they never seem to have come through. But in the last, 
couple, couple, two or three years, I've been seeing some uh, a, a change, and it's been nice to be able to to see like like yourself, um, uh, be there for for uh, the black farmers, and 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 Dr. Ruth has certainly been helpful with the, the emails and the information, putting it out there. But there there needs to be more of that. It, it you know it it can't be a, a just in the moment thing. It's something that needs to continue for uh, uh, young people who have any idea that they might want to get involved in, in, in farming to be able to access some of that stuff and for it to be available. And, you know, and then to put it into the schools, you know, at an earlier age, not, not when you get to college, you know, and, and everybody's gone this way and that way, it needs to be put out there that this is, uh, it, it can be a viable uh, uh, career and, and, and uh, a thing to get into. Thank you, Donald. William? Yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Donald just mentioned, just having ways for, for the exposure to this work and the benefits and the hardships too that come with this work for that to be exposed more early on for, for young folks and for beginning farmers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just talking from a different positionality too because I don't, I don't own any land and I haven't been able to like start on my, my my land stewardship farming journey on that level yet but just to speak to the nature of like the farm I'm at now which is owned by the university there has been a lot of you know very important advocates um, part of the administration and the people on the, in the inside of the university some people maybe on this call like you know Jennifer Sauerwein and Julio like people that work with the UC Agriculture Extension to really um, support the work that we're doing here on the farm because Tentatively, we are in an occupation right now. Any day, you know, an investor can, can make a deal with the university and capital strategy is going to come boat lock, boat lock it and then start cutting down trees. And even though it's not going to happen in that way, like that's how it's happened in the past before. And like the very like quick, um, just always, always needing to protect what you have and like never things being secure. Like it's the nature for a lot of farmers, um, especially black farmers who don't own their land and who are dealing with a lot of their neighbors, you know, white supremacy and just like um, Dennis mentioned too, just like taxes and the financial barriers behind farming. But, but yeah, I just want to reiterate that like we, we need support, period. Doesn't matter from who or what, but definitely these institutions that can and have leverage um, to do that. Like, like yeah, there, there, there's a lot of connections that can be made. There can be more programs for, for, for young folks to get into farming. You know, there can be more like, financial support set up for for young farmers especially coming out of college or coming out of high school you know whichever it may be um but yeah i think ultimately just just being seen more having our stories be be told more having the the connections and the networks be honored more too because yeah i'm not going to do everything by myself i can't individually acquire land and, and you know pay off pay off um ownership and property taxes by myself so i i i have to you know connect with the people that are aligned with the vision I'm having. And I also have to, yeah, you know, every time you're done talking, Dennis, you're like, that was a lot, but thank you. It's like, that makes me think, yeah, the closed mouth never, never gets fed. And so just how, how, what it means for us to like ask for help historically already being like undeserving of it and expecting that we don't need it or that they don't want to give it to us. Like we have to ask for it and make it very clear what we need because people are, do have the resources to, to um, to provide that and yeah rightfully so you know that that should be given so um it's unclear for me i just ask people on the uc and uc a and r and just to keep advocating for us keep making sure the voices are heard you know i'm always i'm always aware of like representation within spaces and like how people love to talk about black people without black people present or without talking about blackness as a very diverse you know culture in itself and like even even this conversation, like I, I realized that, you know, we're all black men here talking about farming, but most of the world is is fed by black women, period, around around the world are indigenous women. And so, of course, like we have to honor the work that we're doing, but there, there's always, you know, more to talk about and more to push forward, more conversations to have. And most of the times those won't be comfortable conversations. So just re yeah, really pushing people just to like have those hard conversations, you know, pr protect your people um uplift black people uplift uplift black trans people and just like really see who who is the most oppressed and who who it, whose liberation is connected to everyone else's liberation by default and like 
how can we all really work together um, to do that and make that be seen? Thank you, William. And for, for those words to encourage us not to stop here, um, this is the first group, but what do we do to reach out and, and reach out to farmers? And I want to say to Ruth, thank you, because when we were scratching our heads, not knowing where to get our own, uh, we reached out to Ruth and say, Ruth, uh, because like Dennis said, I met her, I met him when at the conference that was organized by Ruth, and she was able to reach out to Dennis and Donald, and here we are. And I am glad because we have this is we are looking to represent the this, the whole state. So right now we are in Central California most of the time, and I'm thinking from this group we are able to probably now go to Southern California and bring experiences as this to the whole ANR. And I think the, uh, the, the other question is in the future, right now, as I'm saying, and many people probably would agree with me, it's difficult to just, even the farmers themselves, you acknowledge, you find that you are only one farming in, in a range of like maybe you have like 20 farmers and you are only one farmer in that area. So my question to you, like looking into the future, what do you think can be done to, in, to encourage black people to dive into farming if there is anything at all? Um, Dennis, I know you are working with a group of people, probably you can start. <laughs> okay. Um... I want to make sure people can hear me. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, what I what I am working to accomplish is to grow healthy food, food that that um, is some of the things we know about and some of the things we don't really know a whole lot about. Uh, like I mentioned, the Awey do um, uh, what they call Egyptian spinach. Um, you know that kind of thing. Well. I want to be able to, to grow things, and then I want, and this is where you use social media, you, you want to show people through demonstrations, this is what the seed looks like, this is what the crop looks like when it's growing, this is what it looks like when you're ready to, har what the fruit looks like and when you, and wh and when, when you harvest it, uh, and then this is, this is a way you can prepare it. I think a lot of people don't eat certain things because they never had it. Or when they, if they did have it, it wasn't, it didn't taste well, or it wasn't well, it wasn't done the uh, in a way that was acceptable to them. And so you want to show people how it can be prepared. And so one of the things that I, I I hope to do, like I said, use the state state historic park as a way to promote these these the, these uh, products the, 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 this produce uh, with vent, through vending and 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 then eventually I want to get to the point where you can have first second third place uh, competitions like you see on Food Network and and you want to put this stuff on social media so that you help people to to really see uh, a fascination maybe an excitement to this and want to try it uh, you know just think about it. A lot, when we many of us didn't grow up seeing a, a, a food network I mean you might have had Julia Roberts or or some I mean Julia uh, Childs or someone like that um, but but you didn't have a lot of you didn't have a whole channel designated for uh, food preparation and, and and tasting food and all of that kind of stuff but because of that so many more people now are interested in trying to cook and so I think this is one of the ways that 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 you can do that. And every region, uh, I mean, you can't grow everything in 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 uh, within a region, but you can grow certain things. There are certain things more conducive for a certain region. And um, and so we want to be able to do something like that. And then, like I said, demonstrations, show demonstrations, what it looks like, how you can prepare, it, and um, and even have competitions. And I think when you do something like that then you, you create an interest in uh, what is being grown. And, and, and someone says, well, 
well, I, I, I think I could try it. I think I could do that. Well, wow, that was simple. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to try that. So I think that's that's the way you can kind of go, go about it. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Denise, Donald? Oh, me or? Donald. Am I up? <laughs> Your name, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, um, for me, you know, and I know it's not just me, but uh, because uh, I, you know, I can control what I do and, and, and what my visions are. So, you know, that that's mostly what I'm going to speak to. You know, I have a, a, a produce stand and I'm working on it to be able to get that thing up to where it can run 12 months out of the year. And in turn, I want to hire some of the some of the young black youth that are um, in the community to, and, and so they can see what it's like to raise stuff from, you know, from, from the dirt and then be able to bring it and possibly even encourage them to get into the agricultural business and the, the many phases, whether it's in the business aspect of it, being, becoming sellers of the product or, or, or growers, uh, transportation, there's so many facets of it that they can become involved with. And like I said, I, you know, I got a lot of stuff on my shoulders and I'm trying to get it done, but it takes money and it takes time. But um, and being able to get that done, to be able to show that there, there, there's profit in this, there's, there, there are things that are uh, attractive. You know, it's hard work, but there's still a lot of attractive things that, that go along with it. And then for, for the universities and, and, and even the financial institutions, you know, you got to be, they got to be able to put it out there to show that, hey, they can get some type of backing to be able to want to get involved um, in it and, and you know, and, and, and teach, put, put, put the information out there. Um, I myself, you know, last year before the pandemic uh, hit, um, I wanted to uh, put on a, um, a big watermelon festival, you know, around where, where my, uh, where my shop is, close off the streets and be able to have a bunch of vendors, the same thing, just like what Dennis is talking about, and uh, even reach out to the uh, extensions to be able to bring booths and everything out there so the kids could see how this, you know, the circle, you know, where from the dirt to here, to, hey, you know, you learn all of these things. And I'm still going to do that, but, I, you know, when things become safe again, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I'll be working with a whole bunch of local people who are trying get that done and some other farmers and stuff you know that are interested in possibly trying to do something like that but we we have to just keep putting the information out there okay donald william uh, yeah i'm just on a time I'll, I'll be real quick um but everything that dennis and donald already mentioned just exposure letting people know this is how broccoli grows for example and just the way that kids react to seeing things grow in the ground versus seeing it in the superstore is like night and day. Yeah. Um, and when I think about it, I just think about the land and how there's so many different points of entry for people reconnecting to the land. Doesn't matter if you're a farmer or an artist or a, you know a filmmaker. You know you could you could be doing it into dance. You could be into environmental education you could do anything on the land. And I think that's, that's what it comes down to for me is trying to get people to not think they have to show up on land in a particular way. Like at the farm, we don't just plant things. We don't just harvest things. We actually, we come together, we talk, we build community. You know, we, we engage each other's interests. You know, there's people that come to the land and, you know, just, just want to be here and just want to sit and read a book and like think about their life and, and do those sort of things. So just really emphasizing the healing part of, of, of land and earth stewardship and farming like is like yeah this capitalistic model that we got to be running we got to be working all the time we got to be making a profit which is very real and very important to think about but not not to be centered and not to be focused on all the time it's like we have to actually check in with ourselves see what we need you know do we need to work today you know do we need can we take a break when do we get a break you know when when do we get a break as black people already as farmers, as people working the earth already, when are we gonna get a break and a time to breathe? And no one's gonna make that for us. We have to make that for ourselves. Right. So I just let people know, yeah, this is, this is, you ain't gotta do nothing to be on land. You can just be here. This is where you're supposed to be. This is what your ancestors were doing. This is what you should be doing. And people thinking about it in a revolutionary way is we have to learn how to be on land and grow food and do the things to sustain our own communities before we have to. Because right now we don't really have to. We're, we're working in a system that 
you know, it's very transactional. We make money, we buy things, but there's going to be a point when all this is going to collapse and we have to be ready for that. So hoping that we're just preparing with the tools to be ready for that. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing. Just to echo what Donald was saying that there have been these um, fundings out there, but some people are not willing to go and get these fundings because of what probably happened some time ago. So I'm just saying it out there to like, it needs us, the educators go out there and tell people what is there, but you should know that you are going to sometimes get that, that resistance because it happened in the past that there were some things that were put to people and they, they didn't work out. So it takes mm -hmm. talking and talking and talking and probably at the end of the day, you will get someone to apply for funding. Also, just to talk in the meetings, John, let's not just talk about water, just talk about things, share with people when you are out there, uh, it, will, it might be helpful to them. By this, they share, I know I've eaten into your time, but I thought we needed to hear what the growers have to say. So we have a few minutes for question and time. So let's share, take it on, take it. Thank you, Esther. Um, the first question, I believe it's it's been answered and it was, what have you found to be the most difficult challenge in dealing with local state county policies and regulations? And do you have suggestions on how to overcome those policies that may have hindered your business? I know the, the farmers talked about, you know, taxes and access and resources and support from just about everybody is needed. So not only cooperative extension, the UC, but every entity that can support um, black farming is needed. So I think that one was answered. So I'll move on to the next. And this is for all the panelists. And it says, have you considered a plan of succession, be it within your own family mentorship and or black community that would be willing to pass what you have achieved in farming, be it land or skill, given all the challenges in purchasing land and equipment. And I think Donald talked about hiring black youth, um, which I think is so important to um, introduce them to farming. But if you guys have anything else to add about your plan of succession, um, go ahead and share it. And we can do it popcorn style. Um, Okay. Donald, you go first, or Dennis, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. What I would say is, you know, I have like five people who work with me, um, and they are local people. They they live in the community. Then you know some you know during the summertime it's like three teenagers, but but for the most part I have uh, a, a black guy and a Hispanic guy who live in this community working with me so that the people in town see that something is really happening because there are no businesses here in this, this little community. So that's one of the things, but, but, but what I wanted to say a while ago was, uh, and, and I'm, I, I'm sorry about this, but, but water, you see, there are all kinds of regulations now about this water. You just, so, so you got to have a flow meter on your, on your pump, um, on your well so that, that now they are reg they are keeping up with how much water you use because the the state is very concerned about overuse of water and they're concerned about all these nitrates going into the soil so you have to be on top of that stuff or you will be penalized that goes back to what you said before so that's it thank you um we'll go to will succession plan yeah Thanks. Um, I'm thinking of a plan first because I know that I have a lot, a lot of st still things to, to to create the foundation. But I think about that a lot still because, I mean, a lot of knowledge from my elders is like we think in the future for the next seven generations. So even though I'm young now, I'm still thinking about like every move that I'm making as the foundation for the next seven generations, for my family, you know, for people who I, I want to just see protected and cared about. So, like, yeah, I think that talking about like community land trusts, talking about black land trusts, talking about, you know, conservation easements, just different ways where, where black people and really just people in general can think about ownership in a different way and own land communally and kind of like stray away from this 
this concept of like individual ownership and, and privatization, I, I really view that as, as a hope for the future and as a succession plan that I would, I would want ideally to happen as I acquire land and as I am part of whatever group or network that acquires land is like, how do we protect this for many, many, many generations down and make sure that it's still being used for the purpose of building community, growing food, protecting the earth. Thank you. Donald? Uh, I have a, a son now. He, he, he's a graduate from Fresno State, but he, he, he wasn't an ag major. But I am starting to nudge him in the, <laughs> in the direction <laughs> to be able to take over a little bit. But there, there are nieces and nephews, um, some of them that actually live up in the Bay Area. And like for the first time, they, they were down last year and they were able to come out and grab, get strawberries, cantaloupes, honeybees, everything. And uh, they, they, they had a blast. And so I'm, I'm trying to nudge them and get them down and look at things. And uh, so, you know, with, with, with family, obviously, you would, you would love to be able to leave things in, in, in good hands. And, and I, I plan to try and do that. But uh, and, and if and if they're they're not interested, I'm gonna find somebody around there that that, that wants. To <laughs> but, but, but we're, gonna, we're gonna see if we can't get some black hands in there to, 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 to carry on. And, you know, whether whether it's my property there, uh, fruit stand <laughs> business, or whatever it is. But but uh, that 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 is my intention. Thank you. Um, next is a comment, and I think it's, um, I just, I think it's a, it gives some pretty important stats. So it says, um, per 2017 census of ag in California, there were 124,405 producers slash farmers. Out of that number, only 429 were Black or African American. You three are a rare group. So, so kudos to you all. Um, it is 310 and I think I'm going to stop there um, out, out of respect for time and, and just quickly say thank you to all of you that have stayed on this extra 15 minutes and I will pass it on to um, Ron Walker who is going to close us out for today. Uh, go ahead Ron. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to say real quick, I tried to grow a potato and it wouldn't even grow. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying to <laughs> so, you know, I may be the wrong guy. But anyway, we had a really, really uh, impactful week. Uh, we had some great speakers, um, you know, or for the month, I'm sorry, we had some great speakers, really, really, really good information to get out there. And I'm going to try to do this in the five minutes. I know people like look man we you know time time i get it but i'm going to try to get through this so first and foremost i want to thank um uh, john fox uh who's our director of hr uh, he's going to be retiring here pretty soon we, we wish him well in his uh in his next adventures uh and also glenda uh, humiston who's uh, who really has helped us out uh not in just support and recognition for our causes but in the the financial spectrum so we appreciate that uh kelly mcfarland and and uh and janine iorga uh, and the boc for kind of coordinating and getting the Zoom stuff. I mean, we're all, some people don't even, you know, we're trying to get the mute and the stop and the videos and the, I mean, they're, they're really helping us and coordinating that and getting that stuff done. So we appreciate that. Uh, our speakers today, thank you so much, Donald, uh, Dennis, and Will, you guys brought it. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for, for that. I'm sure everyone on the call and, and we love to, the fact that you guys are close too is really cool. So I, I really like that. Um, in prior weeks, uh, we had Sonia Lewis, uh, we had Mary Blackburn, thank you very much, uh, aka for Mary Blackburn, Dr. B. Uh, I don't know if she's on the call, but, but she, she knows what's up. Uh, 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 Chinook Yezreel, we had him a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it was last week, and then um, uh, that's, that's for the speakers. And then we get into uh, the planning committee. Uh, those people that have put together these four uh, events during the month, and we can't thank them enough. That's Esther. Obviously, thank you very much for, for coordinating and getting this good. Uh, Keith, Keith, without you, I mean, remember we talked about that bass and vibrato? You, you brought it, brother. We, we got it here. So, uh, Lachey, Lachey, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything you've done. And, and Nicodemus, if you're on the, I, I think I saw him on there. I think he, yeah, he's on there somewhere. He's on. Yeah. Nicodemus. Yeah, big ups, big ups. Thank you so much. Uh, continuing down the line, uh, promote uh, promoters and organ, uh, organ, uh, organizers, uh, the Black and Allied employee groups, a lot of those are uh, members of those are on the call now. Thank you very much for, for your time and attention to this. Uh, the DEI Alliance and DEI Alliance Learning Committee, uh, thank you very much for your time and attendance to this. 
and all of the attendees, uh, you know, <laughs> some of you have stuck with us the, the, the all four sessions and we are really, we really appreciate your support. Um, just having you on. I mean, uh, we've had internal conversations of the turnout being ridiculous and, and we were very happy to have higher numbers that we, that we thought. I mean, we, it, we had to actually re restructure some of the things we were doing, but uh, Black at UC, that's the Black Leadership Alliance Council at the University of California and, and their members who attended. Um, and finally, uh, there's gonna be a survey um, uh, that's gonna be coming out in the next couple of days. We really, really would appreciate your feedback uh, regarding it uh, and, and let us know what we can do for future programs. Uh, you know, we, we wanna, I think this is the first one that at least I've been involved in. So um, we wanna hear what you have to say and, and take it from there. But thank you, thank you so much. It's been, a, it's been an awesome experience for me and I'm sure for everyone. And uh, I think that does it. And if anybody knows how to grow potatoes, I just wanna grow one. I mean, I just want to learn. How to, okay, I mean, just show me. I just one potato. <laughs> I think we have a lot of work cut for us. I just even remember Shanok last week saying he didn't know how to grow the first time. So, mm -hmm. educators, farmers in this group, Donna, Dennis, we all help out. We yeah. will be reaching out to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one potato. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> Thank you so much for the attendance. We were we have been really, really honored to have you all and for the support. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks everybody. for joining Black History. Celebrate Black people, not just in February, but every day. That's right.